Hi, so in a previous video, we introduced the EGFR family of proteins. So there was uh, the first member, EGFR, uh, but it also has different names. So we see the names here, and this is a figure from a paper. I put the reference down below. Um, EGFR, uh, it, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase, goes by a different name, HER1, also known as ERBB1. Um, the second member of this family is called HER2 or ERBB2 or NU, same protein, three different names at least. Uh, HER3 or ERBB3, that's the third member of the family. Fourth member, HER4 or ERBB4. So again, all of these proteins came from genes that have, share very high homology to one another, and we're going to see that these uh, the proteins that are made from these genes actually interact with one another and all play a role in signaling. So um, they came from a common ancestor gene uh, millions of years ago that has duplicated and evolved different mechanisms uh, of function. And so what do all these proteins do? In general, they play a role in signal transduction into cells. They might be expressed in different cell types. They might be expressed in different times of development. But in general, they play a role in signaling from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So uh, now let's talk about how they work and how they work together. And so this is going to require us to talk about how receptor tyrosine kinases work generally. Right? So we introduced this concept in a previous video. These receptors, which uh, typically exist as monomers on the surface of cells, uh, have very low affinity for one another. But when ligand binding occurs, they dimerize, and then their kinase domains activate, and they transphosphorylate. So when we introduced EGFR, the epidermal growth factor receptor, we said its ligand was EGF, the epidermal growth factor. And that is true. But now we're going to add a little bit more complexity to this, right? Because the EGFR family of receptors actually binds a whole family of ligands. There are many proteins that actually uh, are similar to EGF. So you can see in this um, figure from this paper, it says they're EGF-like ligands. And it turns out that there are many proteins coded by genes. And these proteins, let me step out of the way here, all look very similar to EGF, but they are different from an amino acid point of view and a gene coding point of view. And they might be expressed at, from different cells. They might be being expressed at different times. Um, and so why am I telling you this? I'm trying to confuse you. No, I'm just introducing the concept of uh, ligands can, uh, a receptor can have different ligands. So the EGF receptor can bind EGF but it can also bind TGF-alpha. What's TGF-alpha? It is another growth factor. Although interesting, the GF doesn't stand for growth factor here. And at some point, it doesn't matter what these things stand for. But uh, TGF-alpha is uh, another ligand for the EGF receptor. So EGF can bind the EGF receptor. TGF-alpha can bind the, uh, TGF, uh, the EGF receptor. And all of these proteins um, can act as ligands for members of the EGFR family. So again, why do we have all these different ligands? Well, because we're very complex organisms that develop from one cell to a trillions of cells. And so these different growth factors and signaling molecules play a role in the complex uh, development of the human organism and all animal organisms. So I'm introducing this concept in here because as you read articles about the EGFR family, they're not going to just talk about the, the one ligand, EGF. They talk about a family of ligands. So it's the EGF, or EGF family of ligands. So um, in this cartoon here, you see those circles, those yellow circles. Uh, that could be EGF, but it could also be other things like TGF, alpha, or... EPI or BTC. Um, and again, what are their functions? What are their roles? It's not important. Uh, what I would like you to know is that they can all act as growth factors that will activate members of the EGFR family. Okay.
So if these all can act as growth factors, that means they could all bind the ligand binding domain of maybe not all of them, but maybe some of the members of the EGFR family. Which growth factor goes with which receptor? Uh, that could be a whole separate video that I'm not going to do, but you can investigate that easily um, in the scientific literature. There are plenty of um, research articles about which ligands match which receptor. But in general, uh, we'll just talk about EGF uh, as a ligand. So you'll notice that three of the four receptors in this family uh, have a ligand binding domain. One of them does not, and that is true. We talked about that in a previous video. HER2, which is a member of the EGFR family, also known as the ERBB family, also known as the HER family, um, this can uh, participate in dimers, as we'll see shortly, but it doesn't bind ligand. So it doesn't require ligand binding for dimerization. It actually loves forming dimers um, when uh, its partner has uh, bound a growth factor. So you can see in this cartoon, its ligand binding domain is different than the other family members, and that's okay. Um, now let's talk about dimerization, right? When we talked about how receptor tyrosine kinases work, we talked about ligands binding, and that allows for these receptors, which exist as monomers on the surface of a cell in the absence of growth factors, to be, get high affinity for one another. Ligand binding causes these receptors to change their 3D conformation, and now they have high, con high affinity for one another. So they go from uh, forming monomer, they go from monomers to dimers. And you can see in this cartoon here, when you draw a receptor, it's typically drawn as a monomer, unless it's bound with ligand, and then it forms dimers, which you can see there on the right. Now you will notice that there are different types of dimers because it depends on if a protein of the, uh, if a family member is binding to an identical family member or binding to one of its uh, one of its other family members. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if EGFR, if a cell is expressing just EGFR, and EGFR binds EGF or one of the other ligands, uh, it'll form homodimers. They are exactly the same. But if a cell expresses, let's say, um, well, let me cover the other homodimer that's shown here, HER4. HER4, um, if it binds its ligand, which could be EGF, could be TGF-alpha, could be any of those other ones on that list, depending on which one fits the ligand binding domain, EGFR, or I'm sorry, HER4 will homodimerize with another HER4. But if cells express different members of this family, then you can form heterodimers. And you'll notice here that uh, HER2, for example, loves to heterodimerize with other family members. So if a cell is expressing HER2 and HER3, when HER3 binds ligand, HER2 and HER3 will homo well, heterodimerize. And that's what you see there. Same thing with HER4, same thing with EGFR, right? Uh, so you sometimes get homodimers and heterodimers. You can get them on the same cell, right? If a cell expresses both EGFR and HER2, that cell can form homodimers of EGFR, and it can form heterodimers of EGFR and HER2. Again, which cells in the body express which receptors and how are they different? That's not the point of this video, right? You can investigate that on your own if you'd like, um, but just introducing the concept of these family members can participate in dimerization with one another. Okay. You'll notice that there are some homodimers that aren't shown here, for example, HER2 uh, homodimers, and it is uh, it's possible they do something, but um, uh, scientific literature, scientific investigation says that those homodimers don't seem to be important or do anything or maybe even exist. Um, same thing with HER3. HER3 homodimers don't seem to be a thing, at least the, that's what scientists believe. But here, just introducing the concept that these family members can either homodimerize with another, some of them can, and heterodimerize with each other. You don't have to memorize them all, but now that you're familiar with these different family members and how they can homo and heterodimerize, 
So that'll help you understand how, let's say, um, some cancer cells are mutated in some of these family members, which will be later video. Now, let's get to the last part, transphosphorylation, right? So we talked about these receptors. These are receptor tyrosine kinases. So what does that mean, All right? The vinyl ligand on the outside changes the conformation, dimerizes, and the kinase domain, which is in the uh, intracellular portion of the protein, the cytoplasmic portion of the protein, that kinase domain activates and transfers phosphates to tyrosines. So let's look here in the cartoon here. We introduced the, this uh, concept before. Uh, if you look at the tyrosine kinase domain of these family members, one of them is grayed out. Which one? HER3. Why is it grayed out? Because HER3 uh, has evolved away its tyrosine kinase domain. So it does not function as a tyrosine kinase. Well, but we still had to play in the family members, and we'll see that shortly. All of these proteins still have tyrosine residues in their cytoplasmic tails. That is separate from the tyrosine kinase domain. Tyrosines in the tails are going to get phosphorylated, and we're going to see that shortly. And so I've written, I've drawn out tyrosine residue, a single amino acid Y shown there. And so we know that when these receptors are monomers, right, that the tyrosines are typically not phosphorylated. Now, when ligand binds, causes dimerization, we got homo and heterodimers. Now what's going to happen to those tyrosines? Let's look at just the EGFR heterodimer. So we in, that's the first thing we introduced in one of our previous videos, that uh, EGFR dimerizes, and the kinase domains activate. They grab ATP, transfer phosphates to one another, to, so transphosphorylation, um, and you get phosphorylation of tyrosines. So that can happen for EGFR homodimers. What about HER2, I'm sorry, HER4 ho homodimers, the next one over? Sure, dimerize, kinase activates, transphosphorylation. So you get phosphorylation of tyrosines. And if we look at the EGFR HER2 heterodimer, well, they, they both have kinase domains on the inside. We know HER2 is missing, it uh, has evolved away its ligand binding domain, but that's okay, because it forms heterodimers, kinase active, transphosphorylation of the tyrosines. So that is gonna send a signal in the cell, we'll see that next. Uh, let's skip over to HER4 um, and HER2. Um, they can form heterodimers, kinase domains, transphosphorylate. The last one, what about the HER3? It's grayed out. Uh, what's it going to do? Well, it's not going to phosphorylate its dimer partner, but its dimer partner does have a tyrosine kinase domain and will activate and will phosphorylate the tyrosines in the tail of HER3. So, in general, the EGFR family of receptor tyrosine kinases participates in ligand-dependent dimerization, transphosphorylation, which results in, the whole point of this, was to send a signal into the cell. And most of the times, this signal would get the cell to go through the cell cycle, from G1 phase into S phase, G2, M, mitosis, make more cells. So the whole point of having these proteins here is to regulate signals to send it from the outside of the cell into the cell. And the EGFR family really does play a huge role in, pro in controlling proliferation of the cell, getting cells to go through the cell cycle. So uh, I will see in a later video um, how these signals can be disrupted in human cancers. But now hopefully you're familiar with the EGFR family and how the family members interact with one another to uh, signal into the cell.